All right, coming down in three, oh, no, no. two, no. He wasn't ready. Okay, here we go. Coming down in three, two. Welcome back to the History of Rock. His name is Brandon, and he is the DJ. His name is Shim. He is the rock star. You didn't say it. I congratulate you for you. not stumbling there. However, I did leave in the fact that you were off screen when um, I started the countdown. So I'm leaving You're that awesome. in the podcast there. <laughs> well, Shim was he's like, oh, let's, let's go. Let's do this. And then I just I click record. I'm looking over there. And then all of a sudden I looked yeah, up and going. Shim's not there. I had to close the door. That door was open <laughs> and it needed to be closed. All right, so we're talking about Woodstock. We fell down a whole bunch of rabbit holes in the last episode. We're covering the original Woodstock here. This is part two. And then coming up later on, of course, we're going to get to uh, Woodstock 94, which would be the 25th anniversary, and then Woodstock 99. And then coincidentally enough, the 50th anniversary that was supposed to happen back in 2019 did not happen at mm-hmm. all um and we could even bring that up because it was kind of like how do we you not to. even how even with how bad 99 apparently went how do you not have a 50th anniversary of yeah. woodstock but yeah well, that's all the stuff we're gonna we'll get, get into to. all of it we're gonna and get before into we do it. i'm gonna mention you guys want to go to viva la Recording mocha in progress god damn gotcha. it shim <laughs> i was waiting god. i was waiting for the perfect moment to do it <laughs> christ almighty <laughs> I do need to get a graphic up here for for Viva La Mocha, uh, it's, which, as you can see here, here's the shirt. This is the Cross-Eyed Bear shirt for anybody watching. It's not fair to deny me the Cross-Eyed Bear that's gave to me. So if you're listening on Google or Apple, we appreciate it, but you're going to want to probably head to Spotify, allows us to put up video, and uh, YouTube. Go to my YouTube channel. It's a race between Shim and I to see who can get more viewers. So go to at the Real Brandalorian on YouTube to check out all of this content, plus all of the, we do like the little shorts and stuff that are clips from the episodes, like Shim talking about Dave Navarro's nipples. That's that's that the was selling point. That's that the, was that's one the of them. teaser. Yeah, that's okay. bouncing nipples. Right. But anyway, go to vivalamoca.com. That's where you're gonna find the merchandise and uh, the songs. The songs are coming as well. I know Shim and they I are. we had originally been doing, um, you know, some songs in the episodes, and then we realized, eh, maybe we want to give this a little more thought. So he and I are gonna start recording that here. Soon, but let's dive right back in here to... How often do we actually say that to each other? Maybe we should give this more thought. That doesn't happen. That means that it's going to be really great when we finally get around to it. We we say that all the time. How often do we follow through with it? No, we never follow through. So, uh, oh, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Even though there's a little pop-up that comes up every once in a while. I do it. Disregard that. Focus on what I said. Focus on what I am doing. I think it comes (laughs) up like four times in an episode. And so if you're listening... Um, like, like I was speaking uh, to my buddy Alan, who listens to the podcast, and he said that he Alan! he uh, he generally listens to it in his car while he's driving to work. And because I asked him, um, you know, why don't you watch the video version? He says, well, because I just listen to podcasts while I'm driving. So you're going to hear this little click, 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 like in the middle. It's probably going to take you off guard if you're just listening through Google or, or Apple and you're not going to know exactly what it is. That is the reminder to get people to like and subscribe. The one that Jim was supposed to send me that he never sent. So we left off in the previous episode for Woodstock. We were talking about how the tickets were 18 bucks in advance, 24 at the gate. They sold 186,000 advance tickets. They were only expecting 50,000 people to show up. And they got so delayed on um, picking an actual venue because this didn't even take place in Woodstock. It was supposed Hmm. to take place in Woodstock and ended up in Bethel, New York, which is like 40 miles away. Because the town of Woodstock was like, mm, hippies, get the fuck out. Uh, mm. Like, we don't want you. Um, and they tried a bunch of different towns. So they weren't able to build the gates. They weren't able to build uh, the ticket booths. The actual things to contain the, the, the people within said area. The, thing, so, the things that made the tickets worth buying in the first yeah. place. Yes, because if there's a fence, you couldn't get past that fence yeah. if you didn't have a ticket. But no unfortunately, fences. they didn't put the fences up. So by oh, Sunday, this is where we're picking this thing up at. Um, by Sunday, the 17th, New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller called Roberts and told him he was thinking about ordering 10,000 National Guard troops to the festival. But Roberts persuaded him not to. Sullivan County, where Bethel is located, declared a state emergency. That's dope. That's fantastic. And like we had mentioned in the last pro- uh, podcast, too, is that the town of Bethel, they just stopped enforcing their codes and yeah. laws because they were kind of afraid. Like, 
there was like half a million people start uh, suddenly bum rush your town mm. uh, and you're not expecting it and that could be yeah. and now you know why all those other cities like Woodstock and uh, I think it was Wallkill New York why they were said no we don't want your stuff here but uh, yeah. personnel from the nearby Stewart Air Force Base helped ensure order and they actually airlifted performers in and out of the concert site that's fantastic that's the, it, that might have been the first time that they felt like those sorts of rock stars. I don't know Motley Crue used to be like, well, that's how we go to our festivals now. We just fly in and fly out. But that would have been the first time that rock stars were flown in to festivals and flown out, right? Yeah. Oh, wait, just and wait till just... we get to Iron Butterfly, dude. Because it's, okay. it's a crazy story with Iron Butterfly on here. So some of the numbers from the festival include some of the... Okay, this is, this is the best. Okay. Some of the numbers from the festival include... Two recorded fatalities, one from insulin usage and the other from when a tractor ran over someone sleeping in a hay field. Mm. Fucking what? Yeah. That is intense. And that doesn't come up in the documentary, does it? They nope. they they kind of just drove over that part of the story. Waka waka. So, look at look at Shim <laughs> with the, the the horrible humor there. There were two recorded births, which I think is awesome. Could you imagine being because born that means that those stuff? two spirits needed somewhere to go, yeah. and four miscarriages, and no one knows exactly what. Anyway, um, there were seven hundred and forty-two drug overdoses. I would have assumed there were a lot more drug overdoses. Well, that's recording. a lot less births. Yeah, you're right. And then, yeah, that's fantastic. I love that there were babies actually born at Woodstock. Like, what yeah. woman at nine months decides they're going to... Oh, just wait. We'll get to, to Joan Baez here in a minute. Right. But this is one of the things that I want to do, because obviously we're covering the original Woodstock here. Next episode will be Woodstock 94. The episode after that, it'll be Woodstock 99. And then the goal uh, is to like get the numbers and kind of compare and contrast the two. So that we yeah. can kind of see exactly where they line up. Because I believe Woodstock 99, I believe it had three recorded deaths. I think, if I remember correctly, because I looked it up. Because in that one documentary that I watched that's on HBO about Woodstock 99, mm. they're, they're interviewing this one guy who his friend was one of the guys that died. And it had to do, like, he, was, he wasn't treated properly. Like, he had heat stroke. And it, it was just, it was, it was all around kind of a debacle of everything that happened, so... Damn. It's you. Yeah, I know. I'm just making sure this thing's recording here because I can't. I'm going to stop it and we're going to be right back. Okay. We're going to do that. <sighs> it's still not giving me a goddamn counter. But we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Jim's on his phone. Yeah. No, yeah, I yeah. still I don't have a counter, but at least I know what the time is now when we're when we're starting. So, but anyway, so yes, it was on me. We just got going done going through the numbers there on the fatality. So Joan Baez, we're going to talk about some of the performers and some interesting stories here. We go. Here, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. This, is, what, this is the only thing. And this is what they've actually tuned in for. They're like, like Jesus fuck the kids Christ, and fuck it took you an people. episode just, and a half to get just, to this. Yeah, come on. Like when did Hendrix? Yeah, let's go. So Joan Baez, she played Saturday morning <laughs> at twelve fifty five a.m. So, I mean, I guess it's technically morning. And she was six months pregnant at the time. Okay. Because nice. they were just talking about how, why would somebody who was, you know, like nine months go to Woodstock? Well, Joan Baez was six months pregnant. She was up there. Yeah, but she ass. went there. Everyone knows why she went there. She went there for the money. <laughs> Country Joe McDonald. Country Joe McDonald. Is that a guy? Is that, yeah. that was his legal name on his birth certificate? Well, I don't think that was it, but. Country Joe McDonald was brought in at 120 on Saturday. For an unscheduled set, an unscheduled set as Santana wasn't ready to take the stage yet. He would perform again on Sunday. So Joe McDonald actually did two performances at Woodstock. Yep. Nice. Because he had to anyone who cares about Joe McDonald. Ready. Um, anyone? I couldn't say I'm familiar with the songs, although Mountain, which is famous for Mississippi Queen. They played at 9 p.m. on Saturday. And this was actually this was the band's third gig together. Dude, Stew could on you that. imagine? That's amazing. Your th their third gig ever. That's so great at Woodstock. Oh man. Okay, the Who performed from five to six a.m. on Sunday. Everyone was playing between midnight and six in the morning. Like, yeah. why wouldn't they shut the stage down? Why wouldn't they stop the bands at midnight and say we're starting up again at eight? 
something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Why, why, why the fuck is the stage open after midnight? Well, they have. Well, hold on. I, I let me let me see if I can find the actual series of events of of the times that, that everybody. Yeah, that performed. is a bit weird. Yeah. Um. So, <laughs> yeah. It started. Richie Havens played at. He started five oh seven on that Friday, and then that was wrapped up by Joan Baez at twelve fifty five. She played until two a.m. That morning, and then the next day, it, things kicked back up again just after noon. Um, that's when Country Joe McDonald came out because Santana wasn't ready to go. Um, right, but the point God, is, is that yeah, they had that, these people playing. They had these people playing all the way through past midnight, 1 a.m. Um, while people were asleep. That's how badly organized this thing was. Yeah, it went. So then Santana performed at 2, and then you have a band at 3.30 and then 4.45. By 6 p.m., the Incredible String Band was up there. Then 7.30, 9 p.m. Mountain. That's not not Mountain Time, but Mountain the Band. That's the one that we just Mountain. talked about. Then the Grateful right. Dead played at 10.30 p.m. This is uh, Saturday. Yeah. CCR, Creedence Clearwater Revival, finally played at 12.30 a.m. And they just kept fucking rolling with Janis Joplin with the Cosmic Blues Band at 2 a.m., Sly and the Family Stone at 3.30 a.m., The Who at 5 a.m., and Jefferson Airplane then performed at 8 a.m., that's on just Sunday. so stupid. No one thinks about that, do they? Oh, like, just all wait. of these great bands doing all these great performances. But if the crowd is literally asleep in the mud, why doesn't someone say, "Let's reevaluate the situation. Let's oh, make changes." Oh, just wait, Fucking- because you, the next one you have is the Who, which was five. To the six. Who performed. Yeah, they performed at five to six a.m. on Sunday, but they were briefly interrupted by Abby Hoffman. What does that mean? Abby Hoffman. He was sort of a political activist. There was a. Um, I believe he's the one. It's it's him, you know, in Forrest Gump when they're at yeah. the mall yeah, yeah, in yeah, Washington, yeah. and he's like Forrest yeah. Gump, and he's wearing the American flag shirt. Yeah, and and yeah. she's all Forrest Jenny. Yeah, and he fucking runs. Yeah, I remember. Um, and but there was By the a way, movie for, sidebar. I have watched that movie more than any other movie in the history of my life. Forrest I've watched Gump. Forrest Gump more times. I can. I know every line. It's disgusting. It's really fucking sad. It's a great movie. Don't be embarrassed <laughs> by that. It's a great that. movie, but I should have found better things to do with my time than watch, <laughs> watch Forrest, Forrest Gump, Gump enough times to be a- to be able to talk like this. We just, just uh, have you seen Sidebar? Have you seen the movies that made us on Netflix? Yeah, I love it. Have you seen love the one it. on Forrest Gump? Yes, of course. Ah, <laughs> that's, love that's it. the most I've watched on Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so back, so going go back to, to Abby Hoffman here, too. He, um, There was a movie by Aaron Sorkin, I think is who did it, called The Trial of the Chicago 7. Great, yeah. great movie. I, I, yeah. I, I thoroughly enjoy that, so I, I'd highly recommend that, and I think that's also on Netflix. Uh, yeah. So Jimi Hendrix, we're talking about how things just kind of carried over into the next day. I think most people, when they think of Jimi Hendrix, like he closed out the show on Sunday night. It was like 9 o'clock at night, and he's playing the national anthem, and he's out there just kicking fucking ass. Yeah. Nope. Not not how it happened. Uh, he played at 9 a.m. Monday. <laughs> and ha- about half of the crowd had already left. There was they were down now down to about 200,000 people when Jimi Hendrix finally took the stage. People left before Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. It was Monday. You got to get to work, right? Hippies. Dude, <laughs> fucking Hendrix. They, they got to go get to their hemp shops. <laughs> Dude, that's disgusting. Imagine but, see, that's, being... but that's what seems odd, is that generally, like, when you think of the hippies, they're not the ones that are like, oh, i got to get to work. That's exactly what I was thinking. I'm like, what? what what's the... But so basically, on, on the Monday morning, the festival was supposed to have been over. It kept carrying over and over and over, and they're like, well, we've got these guys. They're here. They're ready to play. We're just going to put them on at 9 o'clock in the morning, the day after the festival was supposed to finish. So the last day of Woodstock was an absolute shit show. Yeah, it the actual started. headliners, the thing that everyone had been waiting for, the moment that everyone was like, we're here, we've traveled, we've done everything, the bands are here, it's finally Sunday, all the biggest bands are playing, and they just fucked it up so much that they put on all of the best bands between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. the next day. Pretty much. So that Sunday, Fuck. what ended up happening, you had Joe Cocker and the Grease Band, they performed at 2, but then a thunderstorm kind of shut everything down, so... The next band didn't come out until 6.30 p.m. Sunday, and that was Country Joe. Country Joe and the Fish. And then that just pushed everything back. You finally had Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. They played at 3 a.m. 
that following morning, and they played an acoustic and an electric set, and Neil Young skipped like the acoustic set. He was like, I don't want to do this. Fucking A, as he should. Yeah. All right. So moving on to the next thing. But, oh, so go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, this just go. Wait, this this just go yeah. No, the, the, go back. You can go through again one more time. Just the the. Uh, oh no, I just I, I stole that whole. You just, one right you just there. cut me off. So yeah. sidebar. And since we're talking about it now for the audience, Brandon read through my point. So now I'm giving Brandon his point as a cue so that he doesn't have to say the things that he just said about, oh, no, that's mine. You say, wait, uh oh. And so but now you have to deal with it. Now you've we it, we didn't do it well enough. We didn't fucking cover each other well enough. And look, that's what Brandon thinks right there. That's how much of a fuck he gives about these things. Just go <laughs> ahead and read the next thing. Just go ahead and read, mate. Well, I mean, we already talked about the bands that performed. The Grateful Dead, Janice Joplin, point. Sly and so the Family go Stone, to Jefferson Your next Airplane. one, it says Brandon. Yeah, that's the me, Beatles. Man. Yeah, the Beatles. So they were in talks to play Woodstock. Uh, they had one condition, and that was that the Plastic Ono band would be able to play. That was the band that John Lennon had with Yoko Ono. That Ooh. request was denied, so they did not I wonder not why. Perform. I wonder why. And, but four Beatles songs were actually performed by other artists throughout the entire weekend. Of course Which is were. not shocking. Dude, Joe Cocker's performance was legendary of um, My Friends. That was a, that that's that version. Joe Cocker's performance of My Friends is more successful than the Beatles one. Did you know that? Did you want to read the next note because he just stole it? I don't give a shit. No, he didn't. Chicago he didn't. <laughs> No, he didn't. No, because that was a note that um so on the at least on the Wikipedia page they have a list of you know, these are the bands that performed and here's some notes about some of the stuff that went on and that is in those notes of Joe Cocker and the Grease Band. It said, played with a little help from my, print, uh, my friends is a specific note yeah. that was put in there. Yeah, there you go. So you I can know go to things. the next one. You didn't actually steal I know it. Things. I was just being a dick. Chicago had been signed on to play, but they were under contract with concert promoter Bill Graham. He booked them for other gigs that weekend to ensure Santana, another band that he represented, would get the slot. So he cock blocked. That's yeah. so common. People think that's, oh my God, I can't believe he did that. That happens countless times that happened to us and yeah. and every band every band it's like yeah i'm gonna that your 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 piece is on a chessboard like move this here to get that there da, 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 da. yeah makes perfect sense can you ever sense. think of but a also, band that 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 got a slot that you wanted because somebody did that i know of them and i'm going to choose not to name them oh come on no 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 no. i'm not gonna because the thing is the bands are, are not no the, it's, it's not, not the fault. band's fault i'm talking about no. like was there a festival that you wanted to do that you didn't get because it was like, oh, well, we want this band here and we want the sick puppies over here. Or we want Shim. Yeah, over there. there's been there's been quite a few. But name it's a just festival. it's just the nature of name a festival. Yeah, we're fucking. Do oh, no, I, I no, I thought you were talking about a band. Honestly, there was oh, so no. many. I can't even I can't. Um, uh, sick fest, rock fest, fest, edge fest, <laughs> anything fest. radio fest, fuck fest, fucking <laughs> like. <laughs> 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 All right, so the Doors, they ended up canceling at the last moment, and according to guitarist uh, Robbie Krieger, they thought it would be just a, quote, second-class repeat of Monterey Pop Festival. No. Okay, so here we get to Bob Dylan. Bob yeah. Dylan, who lived in Woodstock and was one of the inspirations for the festival, was never in serious talks to perform, but they hinged the whole branding at the beginning off Bob Dylan, right? Kind of, yeah, because it was, remember yeah. the... You go back to the last episode where you find out that um, the whole the whole thing started because these two guys wanted to build a recording studio in Woodstock, mm. and then the guys they went to to fund it were like, mm, "No, but how about a festival kind of wrapped around the artists that live there, like Bob yeah. Dylan?" And it turns yeah. out he was never even really in serious consideration to perform out there. Yeah. Uh, another band that was um, the Guess Who they were invited, they just flat out declined. They didn't want to do it. No, mate. That, that. Iron Butterfly was scheduled at three thoughts. Stooges smashed. Moving on. Iron Butterfly was scheduled to perform and are on the festival's posters, but they were stuck at LaGuardia Airport. They were told they would arrive at LaGuardia, be picked up by helicopters, and perform once they showed up, and then be flown out. This all fell through. Yeah. So they didn't. So that they didn't even perform. They were never there. The, da, 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 da. And what do they you think stuck, of dude. when you think of Iron Butterfly? I think of um, uh, Smashing Pumpkins. Why Smashing Pumpkins? A bullet with butterfly wings. Oh God. 
You don't think of the Sorry. Simpsons? You don't think of the Simpsons when Bart swaps out the music in church? And like, and now we have the In in the Garden of Eden by I, Ron Butterfly. <laughs> and then you got the, the old that. lady playing the organ. She's all, doo, 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 I forgot and she's like, about that. Just fucking dude. wailing it. And then all of a sudden, is... uh, he, um, all of a sudden, he's like, wait a minute, this sounds like rock and or roll. <laughs> Dude, I've got to watch. We should do it. That's what we should do when we meet up for Rage Against the Machine. We'll do a Simpsons marathon. Oh, we'll, we'll pick do it, certain episodes. We got to do yeah, a Hullabalooza. 100%. All yeah. kinds of stuff, man. That'll be yeah, great. Dude, that would be the best. That would be really great. All right. So okay. Jethro right, Tull declined according to... Oh, by the way, Jethro Tull, winner of the first uh, Grammy for Best Metal Performance. <laughs> And their lead instrument's a fucking flute. Oh, was, but according to Ian Anderson, he knew it would be huge, but he didn't like hippies and had concerns about inappropriate nudity, heavy drinking, and drug use. That's rock and roll, man. Death Row Toll, and this is that's why you yeah that's that's why you mentioned the Grammy thing. And like they're the least metal band in metal by the sound ever. of it. Ever, yeah, a flute. Now look, I like Death Row Toll, Aqualung. Fuck yeah, my dad and I listened to that when I was a kid. But come on, Ian Anderson, grow a set. This like this these. Bugs Look, I'm bringing this, this up one, in the encore, by the way. These right here. But these this one bugs me. Led Zeppelin. So now we're getting to Zeppelin, right? <laughs> Led Zeppelin declined. Their oh, yeah. manager, Peter Grant, stated, "I said no because at Woodstock we'd have been just another band on the bill." No, that is a travesty. And they, they, they would travesty. not have been just another band on the bill. No, they, they would have been have a band. Owned. They would have been a band on the bill that ended up performing at 8 a.m. because it was so poorly fucking run. Yeah, or uh, like, yeah, or like at two thirty a.m. when everybody's asleep, they're following up CCR. Yeah. Dude, this is <laughs> this is breaking my heart a little bit. This yeah. I didn't think it was going to go quite like this. Go ahead, keep going. See, and like, uh, so Joni Mitchell was going to perform, but backed out to perform on the Dick Cavett show. She would later compose the song Woodstock based on what she saw on TV. Right, that was probably ultimately probably a better move for her. Simon and Garfunkel declined as they were busy working on a new album and everyone went, yeah. <laughs> you don't like Simon and Garfunkel? No, funny. I just think that when you've got all these things against like, you've got Hello, fucking the Beatles, Bob Smart. Dylan, Led Zeppelin, Jethro Tull, Hendrix. I mean, Simon and Garfunkel, they're nice, but like you want people that are going to blow your hair back and I don't think it's Simon and Garfunkel. Against- they had the hair? They, they, you seen Garfunkel's hair, man? Yeah, but they didn't have the fucking stones. How do you think it got like that? Fucking wailing, man. I don't know. Go. The Rolling, Rolling stones, stones, baby! So they were invited, but they declined basically because they were busy. Mick Jagger, he was in Australia filming Ned Kelly, and Keith Richards' girlfriend had just given birth to their son, Marlon. Wow. So that, I, I can honestly say, I've I've seen clips of Ned Kelly. He definitely should have played Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's here's a lengthier one. This is where we kind of get into the the coverage of it. All right. News coverage of the event, live news coverage of the event was limited to mostly local outlets. The national media coverage there emphasized the problems, including headlines that read traffic uptight at Hippie Fest and hippies mired in a sea of mud. <laughs> the New York Times ran an editorial entitled Nightmare in the Catskills that read, the dream of marijuana and rock music that drew 300,000 fans and hippies to the Catskills had a little more sanity than the impulses that drive the lemmings to march to their deaths in the sea. Fuck yes. They ended in a nightmare of mud and stagnation. What kind of culture is it that can produce so colossal a mess? I think people <laughs> might say they might be asking the same questions about the current financial situation in the global economy. Yeah. Like nothing's fucking changed when they want to start throwing judgments around to the yeah. young people. Talking about the lemmings too. And you know that that's bullshit, right? Lemmings falling off the cliff. What? What? That they don't follow each other? They don't. That's not a thing. How do you know that for sure? How because do you know? It came out that the producers for that Disney special that did that, they were basically pushing them off the edge. I what? You've never heard okay. that? Oh, no, no, shit. no, no, no. Hold no. on. I just want to be clear. I just got three very powerful pieces of information that I never knew existed. <laughs> One, lemmings don't jump off cliffs following each other. Two, Disney did a test. And the test resulted in them pushing lemons off a cliff. 
Well, I don't think it was a so test. What the I fuck think it, are you I think, talking about? I think it was more that they were just trying to find something to make their documentary kind of cool, and it, they. What was the it, documentary it was about? Up. It was one of those Disney like nature specials, I thought. And it says here there is one myth that has held on tenaciously. Every few years, herds of lemmings commit mass suicide by jumping off seaside cliffs. Instinct, it is said, drives them to kill themselves whenever their population becomes unsustainably large. Lemmings do not commit suicide. However, this particular myth is based on some actual lemming behaviors. Lemmings have large population booms every three or four years. When the concentration of lemmings becomes too high in one area, a large group will set out in search of a new home. And see, I oh, the biggest... Oh, here you go. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Okay. Ah, son of a bitch. Okay. So why is the myth of... Me- Mass lemming suicide so widely believed. For one, it provides an irresistible metaphor for human behavior, which, by the way, there's a video game. Remember there's a video game called Lemmings? Yeah. And that was like the whole yeah. point was like you had to yeah. like get them all to fall to their death or not or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Someone who blindly follows a crowd, maybe even toward catastrophe, is called a lemming over the past Otherwise century. Otherwise known myth- as a millennial. <laughs> the myth has been invoked... <laughs> to express modern anxieties about how individuality could be submerged and blah, blah, blah. The biggest reason the myth endures, deliberate fraud for the 1958 Disney nature film White Wilderness. It's got to be white. Filmmakers eager for dramatic (laughs) footage staged a lemming death plunge, pushing dozens of lemmings off a cliff while cameras were rolling. The images, shocking at the time for what they seem to show about the cruelty of nature and shocking for now, uh, now for what they actually showed about the cruelty of humans, convinced several generations of moviegoers that these little rodents do, in fact, possess a bizarre instinct to destroy themselves. When did that come out? When I, when did the facts come out? When did the oh, truth come I, out about shit, that? I don't know. I, I just heard about this. Maybe in the last five years, I think Dude, that's that it's not a... true that lemmings just plummet to their death. Dude, I'm not talking about whether who gives a fuck. It's a good metaphor. It works when it works for whatever your circumstances are. I'm talking about a bunch of guys that work for Disney committing mass genocide on a fucking bunch of lemmings. Like, what did the lemmings ever do to anyone except not what we thought? Like, it just we all deserve to burn every one of us. We are just the worst things that have ever been created. Like, lemmings are good. Humans are fucked. Yeah, it says here, <laughs> so White Wilderness, which again came out in 1958, contains a scene. We're going to get back to Woodstock. Yeah, we'll get back to Woodstock. Hold on, we're lemming <laughs> here. So, um, oh, 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 I think we found out um, exactly where. So, okay. 1958, White Wilderness contains a scene that supposedly depicts a mass lemming migration and ends with the lemmings leaping into the Arctic Ocean. The narrator of the film states that the lemmings are likely not committing suicide, but rather are in the course of migrating and upon encountering a body of water are attempting to cross it. If the body of water the lemmings encounter is too wide, they can suffer exhaustion and drown as a result. In 1982, the CBC television news magazine program, The Fifth Estate, broadcast a documentary about animal cruelty in Hollywood called Cruel Camera, focusing on white wilderness, as well as the television program Wild Kingdom. Uh, Bob McKeown, the host of the CBC program, discovered that the lemming scene was filmed at the Bow River near downtown Calgary. So it wasn't even in the wilderness. It was, I guess, near near downtown Calgary and not in the Arctic Ocean as implied by the film. McKeown interviewed a lemming expert who claimed that the particular species of lemming shown in the film is not known to migrate, much less commit mass suicide. Additionally, he revealed that footage of a polar bear, cl- uh, polar bear cub falling down an Arctic ice slope was really filmed in a Calgary film studio. All oh lies, man. It's all lies. Jesus. That really is a little bit shocking, isn't it? That they would like imagine being the film producer that's like, we need the hero shot. We need to find it. We need to, we need the end of the third act. There's gotta be something's gotta happen. Somebody Some shove those lemmings off a cliff. It's like, but sir, they're not jumping. It turns out that everything that we've completely it's all false and we've made a, a, a fiction. This isn't a documentary. Well, turn it into a fucking documentary. <laughs> Kick the motherfuckers. Oh, and here's how we wrap this all back into. I mean, how do you roll. throw? What is what is the mechanism for throwing a lemming off a cliff? Do you kick it? Do you throw it? Do you pick it up like a cat by the back of its neck and then just sort of drop it? Do you do you do you 
get a little bit of a I think wine kinda, into the I, pitch. No, I think you kind of take your. Do you want to make it? Kinda, to, you're do, you're making movie magic, so you've got to you got to you got to test the levels of their legs to the ground and go. If they were running with the short legs, how much velocity could come from the pitch that they can pitch themselves? I don't, I don't then I need to kick much. accordingly. I got to kick the soccer ball, but like it's a kid kicking a soccer ball because the legs. Because if there's too much thrust, it's not believable. We got no green screen to reverse engineer this shit. So if you were to throw, imagine, imagine having to do a retake. Imagine if you throw the lemmings off, you show it to the movie executive producer a week later and he goes, they're going too fast. I can see the based on the structure of their legs and body composition, they could never physically jump that far. Well, you it know who like that would have been, them. right? Go back and get a hundred more lemmings and do your job properly. You know who that would have been, right? That would have been Walt Weinstein. Disney himself. Would have been that White Disney. Would have Disney. been Walt Disney. White Disney. Would have been White Disney. <laughs> White Disney. <laughs> Imagine Walt Disney. Fucking like get the stop. Oh my god. All right, dude. Like I'm, hold on. I'm bringing this okay. back to rock and roll, man. Because go ahead, go ahead. so White Wilderness was the inspiration for the 1986 Dead Kennedy song "Pot Shot Heard Round the World." Recording stopped. What did you say? Sorry. Stop uh, no, no, I just recorded on my end because I wanted to make sure I have a clip of that last oh my that we God. did on Lemmings. <laughs> All right, going back to did this. Did you need to start it again now, too? Yeah, I probably should start it again. Go ready, but you're going to have to. Recording fire it in progress. No. <laughs> Christ, you got, it's not my fault, guys. Brandon's supposed to turn that notification off on his end. Continued education. What are we uh, doing here? Where, where right, the fuck are we? A- I am lost. I've got Lemmings on the brain, man. I All, got right, so, All right, so... Uh, well, yeah, because we were talking about how the one guy mentioned that. Uh, Ooh, uh, Manson murders. Can I do yeah, Manson murders? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's going to be on the stage. Okay. Hold on. So really quick here. So for continued education, if you guys want to go check out more of it, it's like there's a ton of shit out there that you can watch. There's the 1970 documentary Woodstock. And th- that's the that's the one that it, it paints it like this. It was this amazing festival of, you know, three days of peace, love, and uh, fucking in mud, I guess. Uh, though the festival... Um, it put Roberts and Rosenman close to financial ruin. They were the kind of the two financial backers behind this whole thing. They were the ones who originally in the last episode we talked about, they were going to pitch a TV show about being entrepreneurs. And so they were the two. So the actual concert itself almost completely bankrupted them, but they owned the film and recording rights. So they put out the documentary and that got mm. them back out of the financial hole. And it actually won the Academy Award for documentary feature. So you can check that one out. There is Woodstock Diaries was a three-part TV documentary miniseries in 1994 that shows rare performances and interviews. And then there's also Woodstock Three Days That Defined a Generation. That's a documentary for uh, for PBS that focuses on the social and political context of the festival. Yes, I remember that. By the way, I want to talk to you during the encore about the slap. We never discussed the slap when you said the Academy Awards. Oh, Right, hold on. I want to, I still want to discuss that on, on the on call. We'll talk about that later. We got slap, and then I also have to remember balls. There You're we welcome. go. So make sure you guys tune into the on call to hear about the slap and the balls. On this date. All right. In- so it's the week before. <laughs> so it's August 9th and 10th. And I was trying to find something that was kind of happening around Woodstock, but obviously the major event that was happening at that point was Woodstock. Yeah. But the Manson murders took place the week before Woodstock. So here are some facts about that hey, you might not know about, you know, Charles Manson and his family. Did you know that uh, his birth certificate, his actual name is no name? Oh, my. What? His mom didn't want like, when they came with the birth certificate. She was like, no name. So her name was Kathleen Maddox. So right. his birth certificate just said no name Maddox. Like actual wow. no name. Yeah. That's a bit cold, isn't it? Oh, you know what the oh, oh is? no. Read the next one there, kind sir. Oh, okay. Oh, my God. Oh, this is already breaking my heart. It's Charles his Manson. Mother, his mother. Yeah, you're right, actually. He is Charles Manson. His mother offered to sell him to a waitress for a pitcher of beer. This can't be real. The waitress, believing this was a joke, brought the pitcher of beer. Then Manson's mom left leaving him in the bar. A concerned uncle finally tracked Charles's and the waitress down and returned him to his mum. That woman was crazy. Well, now you're starting to see kind of what created yeah, Charles Manson. Where it comes Is from. it nature yeah. or nurture or probably a little combination of both? Well, uh, it's definitely he's lacking. Yeah. 
His mom, his mom briefly married a man by the name of William Manson, but despite the fact that the marriage was very brief, he, the son ended up taking the name, which is how he became Charles Manson. Mm. So wait, how, he, where, did, where did he get Charles? The Charles part, I don't know. Yeah, that's it. That's the thing I was going to say. Like, where did Charles come from? Anyway, while in prison, Manson would receive 60,000 letters per year. That's the stuff that fucks me up. I'm like, people are like, you know, it's the same as the Unabomber. Unabomber still gets that stuff. But Manson was like, oh, he's crazy. He's got some crazy ideas and he did some horrible stuff. What about the 60,000 people per year that are right? That are like, we're with you, mate. Remember, he we're got out here continuing Manson, the legacy. Manson got engaged. Later on, in prison, like, yeah. and he was like 79 yeah. years old or something like that. Yeah. He also had a celebrity hit list that included Steve McQueen, Elizabeth Taylor, Frank Sinatra, Richard Burton, and Tom Jones. And now, was that something, when you say it's a hit list, that was like the fans that were writing the 60,000 letters, he was telling him, see if you can get rid of these people no, for me? No, no, no. I think that was just, that was something that like before when he was in prison, he was ready to take mm. them out. But speaking of the Unabomber... Um, I remember how he had his list of people that he was like going to send, yeah. you know, packages to and stuff. We had a neighbor that was on that list growing up. What? He Why? lived like four or five houses down the street. I don't remember what he did, but I remember my dad telling me the story. And he's probably listening to this right now and he'll probably text me uh, to remind me of exactly what it was. But I believe it was one of our neighbors that lived right down the street was on the Unabomber's hit list. You don't know why? What, what his affiliation I, was? Yeah, I don't. I don't remember why. So, Dad, help me out. <laughs> it might have just been that he was. He went to school with him for a while and didn't share his sandwich one fucking time. <laughs> sandwich. <laughs> feel his like you're sandwich. on the list. By the way, did you ever see? Um, what was it? Once upon a time in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. I never saw it. Oh yeah, no, it was good. It was. It wasn't as good as some of Quentin Tarantino's other stuff, but it's Tarantino. Like, yeah. Well, but also I, the other thing is, I w once upon a time in Hollywood was lost on me because I didn't understand the 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 reference between Manson and the other characters. I didn't realize until the end of the movie that that was a thing. So there was all this long, oh, there was all this build up and innuendo, and I was like, why are we taking forever on? This character. Why is the camera lagging on the car going down? Why is there so much suspense? I didn't know. So if I'd known that they were connected, it might have made the movie more of a, a better experience for me. Well, but I you believe, should definitely check it out. Um, the guy that played Charles Manson in that movie also played Charles Manson in Mindhunter. Have you ever seen Mindhunter? Probably, no, I haven't seen that. He, oh, it's, no, I haven't that's seen that. It's a show. Awesome. It, I mean, if, yeah. if you're watching this and you're looking into my eyes... And you're wondering why I'm like this? Because Mindhunter is amazing. It's, uh, right. it's just a fantastic show about kind of how they started to track serial killers. And yeah. there's a scene where they go meet Charles Manson. I believe it's the same guy that was in Mindhunter playing Charles Manson also in um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And he did like it's, it's spot on impersonation. And right. on a quick side note here, did you know that Manson has a song on a Beach Boys album? No. Oh, see, no. I thought you would know this stuff, man. No, I didn't know. That's amazing. Uh, that is yeah, he was Wait, he was good friends with uh, one of the old Beach Boys there. Before, obviously, right? Cease to exist by Charles Manson after Manson. Uh, what does it say above this here? That just um, blew my mind. That blows my mind. I need to. Can you send me a link to that song? I need to fucking hear that song now. Uh, Wilson kept in contact with Manson. So uh, I guess it was Brian Wilson and continued to try to help him out. One of Manson's songs ceased to exist was of particular interest to Wilson, who asked for rights to the song. Manson, eager to get any of his music off the ground, accepted granting the rights for some money and a motorcycle. After Manson accepted, Wilson changed the lyrics, tune and name. So what the fuck did he keep? <laughs> like, that's that's the whole yeah, thing. Uh, <laughs> and he named it. Oh, so the the song that was became with the Beach Boys was um, "Never Never Learn Not to Love." But does that mean that Charles Manson got writer's credit, like his take, name is on the sleeve? Well, it says take no. It says taking full credit. The song wound up on the Beach Boys album 2020 without their other members uh, knowing it was written and created by Manson until later. So he Wilson snuck that bad boy in there. Okay, that's. God, that's I, this is why I love the history of rock podcast, and then and then when why you thank God somebody too. does, and why <laughs> you should like and subscribe and follow and share Smooth. and all that stuff. Smooth, dude. Like no one would have known. Yeah.
No one would have known that. See, this is all the weird all right. shit that I had locked in my brain. I thought I thought that was like common knowledge that that means no, and, that's not common knowledge. Wasn't. All right, no. all right, all right. Well, we went, like, all right. So, well, anyway, so, so, so we're going to wrap this up here. Uh, next episode, we're going to be covering Woodstock 94 for the next couple episodes, and we'll cover Woodstock 99. Again, go get your merch over at vivalamoca.com. Do you have anything else you want to plug? You want you got any nope. live streams or anything you want to do? No, no, no. We'll do that another time. I've got something that's coming up. I'm going to be plugging on a weekly, but uh, it's going to get launched soon. So in the meantime, until then... When that happens, his name is Brandon. He is the DJ. We'll see you next week. Hmm. His name is Shim. He's the rock star. Class dismissed. <laughs>the slap. Oh, like the slap. when you were, I was going to make a gag about um, when you said like, oh, they won best docuseries for the Oscars. And I was about to go oh, back when it mattered before the slap. Ah. And I didn't say it because I didn't want to go down the rabbit hole in the slap. But I realized we never talked about it. No, like, I mean, we, we like we mentioned it, but we were like, God, so many people are talking about it. Yeah, at this it's point. fucking it over. But like, those things. I was like, what the fuck? I, I, I think like there's something that I noticed recently with people in general and everyone's a little fucking weird covid two years inside now everyone's coming out and they're they're we're, we're doing things again and everyone's just a little different everyone's a little fucked up right like i saw tom hanks doing an interview for um the new elvis movie and he is different what are you doing i was being weird you're being weird okay yeah <laughs> so <laughs> sorry <laughs> I thought you might be having a stroke. No, um, no. So, but like everyone's just a little bit weird. And it doesn't surprise me at all. Like you go, you put a, a celebrity like Will Smith in a room for two, with that fucking woman and that family that are all clearly just out of touch with reality. No judgment, but like they're out of, they're out of touch with reality. Yeah. And, and then you, yeah, you walk up on judgment. stage and smack a guy in the face and it's like, okay. But it, the reason I think, that the slap was heard so well across the world was okay. It was Will Smith. Yeah. Celebrities are crazy, but it was more like we're, we're the world in general is like, we're just, we've, we've detached from reality. Like the fact that you can think that would happen. Also the fact that everyone tried to turn it into something that it wasn't. And it was some of those things. It was like, Oh, there's a war on comedy. Well, what does that really mean? No, everyone's just lost sight of where the fucking boundaries are on what to say, what not to say, what to do, what not to do. Like the way that we treat each other in general, in on the general is just fucking cracked now. Like you, you'll talk to someone at a party and they'll suddenly start saying things that are like, that's not appropriate or that's not even the topic we're talking about. Yeah, or fuck I balls. don't care. Yeah, or politics or whatever. And it's like, dude, we don't, it's a fucking party. We just met. I don't want to talk about your stance on abortion. But people think it's cool to bring it up now and be like, here are my thoughts. Blah! Dude, it's fucking it's so funny you bring that up because we ran into this issue. You know, my kid just graduated fourth grade, she's going into fifth grade. And there was a lot of issues with some of the other kids where, you know, we went and sat down with the teachers and, you know, like the vice principal or the counselor, whoever it was. And um like kind of try to get a feel for like what's going on here. And the teachers like were telling us. With, with like especially with covid kids don't know how to interact anymore like there's yeah. so many times well they'll, they'll, they'll be sitting there and all of a sudden like this one kid will look at another one, he's like god that shirt looks really ugly why did you wear that today and kids are generally can be kind of mean to begin with but the teachers yeah. were saying that that filter is almost completely gone now because when you're just in front of a screen and you're typing you're not getting that social interaction you're not getting that reaction from mm. this other from the other kids so you're not sure exactly how what you're doing is affecting the person that you're talking to and yeah. it really stunted the social growth of kids and that's where yeah. I'm really hoping with my kid we we're, want to get her into as much uh, as many activities as possible to try to to stimulate that social growth so you can kind of you know get those boundaries and and figure how it is to interact anymore because I think you're right. I mean, I don't know if the slap necessarily had that much to do with COVID. I think Will Smith is just that far. Like, it's oh, no, so the, weird. You want to look at a guy who went from 
super beloved, amazing human being that everybody yeah. like I I had just gotten done over the winter. I had just gotten done watching his series on Disney Plus. And it was right. this nature series where he's getting back to nature and it's supposed to be feel good and and this is amazing and now I, like I, this is so cool and then all of a sudden like that slap shit happens and you're like yeah wow and then you look at like Jada Pinkett Smith and you're like oh like fuck yeah it it really broke when is toxic the whole... femininity going to start becoming a thing <laughs> no it broke the whole uh, Amber Heard mold of everything yeah I know we can get into that. Um, because everyone wants to hear what two white guys think about yeah, that Yeah, because our lives have been so fucking difficult. Although, yeah. so this brings me to the balls. So, like this, because I found these in Hawaii. And if, if you follow my yeah. YouTube channel, which you should, it's at The Real Brandalorian, you would see the short of when I brought these up. Because I'm sitting there, you know, and these, this the corals everywhere. We were down in Maui in Lahaina. And there's coral all over the place. And so I'd like for the first day as I'm kind of out in the ocean, I was trying to try to pick some up maybe, you know, for my kid, she was going out there and picking some stuff up and I'm like, it all looks the fucking same. And then I just happened to be walking down the beach and I was like, that looks like balls. And so I went and right. I picked up that and this has been sitting on my desk ever since I got back. That's good. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad I know. Oh, that. and I had a panic attack too. And that was super fun. What for? Yeah. So we were, we went to the aquarium and they have this right. really cool, like, 3D sphere show that's all about humpback whales. And it's not a small room, but for some reason, again, this is something I got to figure out, like, in my own head and shit. Um, and a lot of it even goes back to that. Uh, did, I, did I ever talk about the Cancun trip when I thought it would be a good idea to put that bubble thing on my head and try and walk underwater? Terrible fucking idea. No. With claustrophobia. Stupid <laughs> idea. I'll talk about that later. But ever since then, it's kind of resurfaced all this claustrophobia shit. To where right. I can even be in a room that's not a small room and feel like it's closing in on me. And okay. I get really, like, I get panicky. And right. that's what happened at, at this. And, I, and that's, I, it sucks. That's all I was looking forward to at the aquarium. Like, yeah, there's, there's turtles and shit. You can see turtles in the fucking ocean. Like, right. I saw turtles in the ocean. I wanted right. to see this 3D thing. But so I sat down and I put the goggles on. And you look up, it's a big, it's a, it's a dome. It's a sphere. Yeah. Like, it's literally how it is. So as I'm sitting there, I'm looking, I'm like, all right, I'm doing all right. I'm like, my kid's next to me. Well, my wife's next to me. And then all of a sudden the fucking lights went out and I was like, oh, fuck. And it was like, I, I, I almost passed out. Like I legitimately Jesus. almost passed out. So I took the goggles off really quick. I tried to breathe and I couldn't, I couldn't catch air. I'm like, Jesus. So I, I, I leaned over to my wife really quick. So I didn't, I didn't want my kid to know this because right, I, right. I don't want her dealing with this shit as, as right. much as I try to help her out with it. I, I, I don't want her to make these connections of, Oh, dad's a fucking psychopath that has anxiety issues. Fuck that. that you know, so whatever. So, um, I just leaned over and I'm like, I gotta pee. And I fucking just, I got the fuck out of there. And I went through right. the wrong door when I tried to leave. Like I walked into this back room area and I'm like, Oh, fuck. like, <laughs> Oh, dude, it was, it was nuts. It was fucking nuts. But it just, dude. it was another reminder that, I got to get this shit figured out because it's still there and it hangs over my head and I'm missing out on cool shit. Mm. I wanted to see the humpback whales. My wife's Did talking to me You didn't get back about, to see it? No, man. I stayed outside. I stared at the sky where there's no ceiling. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, dude, I'm getting shaky even just fucking thinking about it now. Fucking man. how long does it last for? Uh, it, can, it can be a minute. It can last a day. Okay. And this Fuck one, now, this man. one was pretty fucking brutal. It was, oh, this is the other thing I, I totally hadn't even fucking brought up on the on this yet. I can't believe it's taken us this long. I got to meet Mick Fleetwood. When? Yeah. So <laughs> uh, I know, How? like, and this is in the encore, and we're like an hour into this fucking thing. Um. So on this particular day, uh, my wife and sister stayed back at the condo and kind of did some shopping, and then myself, the wife, and the kid. We went to the aquarium. I had my awesome panic attack. And um, I then drove back across the island to Paia, which is a city or a little town, I guess. And he has a store there called Mick's House of Fleetwood. We had been there the previous day just to kind of see the town and walk around. And um, the person who was working there commented and said, hey, if you guys stop by tomorrow, Mick will be here. All right. I love Tusk. I'm fucking yeah. in. So we drove back. And again, that whole drive 
from the aquarium to Paia, I'm in like fucking pain. Like, just breathe, Brandon. Just fucking right. breathe. We listened to nothing but Fleetwood Mac. That kind of brought the anxiety levels down a little bit, which was nice. Right. And then we pull into the town, and parking is oh, if you want to get my anxiety going too, man, to, to fuck up my parking spots. Like, don't give me an easy parking spot. Like, it will cause me to just fucking spin out. So I ended up parking like a half a mile from the store because it was. I'm like, my wife's like, oh, there was a spot. I'm like, nope, past it. <laughs> and she's like, there's no nope, past it. Like I'm like I'm just I'm like I just need to get the fuck out away from people and just park where I can leave the car. Like that's all I need to do. So, so wait, park- but if you well, sorry, I'm confused. If you yeah. see a parking spot, why if does I it see it anxiety? in time and I can pull into it, cool. But if I'm already remotely even past it, nope, fuck it, I keep going. Like you don't I'm want not to deal gonna, with having a backup and the, it's too stressful. I can't. I can't. I can't. Like it, it, when I'm in that like ang- like anxiety ridden right. state, I can't do it. So I'm like, just fucking go, man. So we right. ended up parking at like the post office, which is like way the fuck down the street. Right. So we walk there, and I'm still like super shaky, like not quite there. Um, you know, I'm st- I'm hanging back. My wife and kid are in front of me, and then we walked into the place, and it was two levels. The store was. So we walk in, this super fucking cool guy, man. I think, I think it was Mick Fleetwood's nephew. Cause I think I overheard him saying, my mom is, uh, my mom is his sister. So right. I'm assuming that's his right. nephew, this guy, right. the second I walk in and this guy and he starts talking, I was like, Whew. I was like, all that fucking anxiety went away. Right. And I, it being in that place and then standing in line, we got to sit and have a chat with him. He talked to my daughter about playing instruments and art and, you know, what form did this art pop up for you? Is it drawing? Is it writing? Is it dancing? Mm. And we were kind of like all of the above, Mick. Right. So we got our picture <laughs> taken with him. We bought a ton of shit. Um, and then even as we left Mick's house of Fleetwood, I went over to, I wish I remembered his name. Um, but I went over to that guy who I think was his nephew and I shook his hand. I just wanted like, Hey, thank you for your, your hospitality and helping us out. Mm. Cause that dude, like legitimately, this guy has no fucking idea, but how chill he was that day. He brought me down from a fucking anxiety attack. Mick did or the, the, the other guy's nephew, nephew the other just guy. his nephew the with how guy. fucking yeah. calm and cool and collected that guy was and just willing to talk and shoot the shit. And of course being around Mick Fleetwood, I mean, let's be honest, yeah. like, that was pretty fucking yeah. cool, man. Yeah, but yeah. from the moment we were around his nephew, it was like that anxiety was just kind of coming down a little bit. And then it mm. just progressively went down. And then we got back in the That's car great. and shot right by the fact back up. No, okay. Oh, fuck. Well, did you tell <laughs> no, no, him no, that? No. When you said, hey, did you tell him that? No, he doesn't need to be burdened with my shit. Yeah. So. Well, no one needs to be burdened with your shit. Better to hold on to it and let it just slowly develop into cancer. <laughs> no, that's why I've got this. That's why we have the Encore, so I can just fucking <laughs> unload all this stuff on anybody mm. who's still sticking around for this thing. On because even part three of Lollapalooza was... Yeah, part three was me talking about uh, my fucking anxieties and shit. So clearly, <laughs> I have some things I need to work through. But yeah, yeah no, it was cool. Does. We got to meet Mick Fleetwood, man. He was a cool It's fucking dude. great, dude. That's fucking awesome. It was fucking Hawaii. So, um... Yes. Anyway, we'll see my that, what else have we got? Is that yeah? <laughs> that was it. I just wanted like it all started with balls, man. Like, think about that. There's a shirt for you. It all starts with balls, that's, Charlie. Yeah. If you're listening, that's a shirt we need. I'll let you borrow the coral so that you can do a whole shirt about it. All starts with balls, or get some balls. <laughs> something I don't fucking know. Get some balls. Get some. Nuts. I'm rambling. I, I'm rambling because that anxiety is starting to come back because I'm getting those feelings Dude. again of being in that fucking. Oh well, fucking move thumb. on. We'll move on. All right. Well, let's wrap it up so that you can go and squelch it and uh, shoot some word. heroin. Yeah, Call that's what heroin's down. for, right? Yeah, yeah. Not, uh, not, not advice. I'm not advising anyone do heroin. It's not good. It's bad. <laughs> no, we did enough of promoting heroin with Allison Chains. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> you don't need. You know, that's funny. That's that. That would be the best advertising campaign for a band. If Allison Chains, you go you transport back thirty years, and you're like Allison Chains. Who's that? You don't need heroin when you have Allison Chains. Oh. Yeah. That's that's an advertising campaign right there. The only fucking ad campaign I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now, okay? The best ad campaign that I ever saw from it for, I mean, I, I remember I was too young to understand what marketing is, what advertising, how it works. I was like fucking 17. When Corn released issues. Okay. Right? I remember 
I'm like, I know Corn. I know their last record. I know the songs. I get it. I, I'm, and you're just going to see Corn and then the album cover. And the entire advertising campaign was just everybody's got issues. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that's the best. Whoever fucking came up with that needs to be paid very well because I was like, it's subliminally, it's like everyone's waiting for this record. Everyone's going to buy it. Everyone's, everyone's got issues. It's yeah. a, it's a pre existing mantra to like, in two months, everyone's going to be saying this at their friend's bedroom, like going through the CD collection when there were CDs and being like, do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have issues? No. Everybody's, like, everybody's got, got issues. issues. What the fuck? And the whole, vo- and then when you hear the records, you're like, yes, he definitely has issues. Definitely. Well, th- and think about it too, because that was the album where they did the album cover contest and they had yeah, the that's different, right. and I wanted to buy all of the, but I was a broke ass. So I didn't have the money. So I only bought one album cover. Uh, yeah. And I think that was also around, actually, it might have been after the first Family Values tour. And I remember the MTV yeah. commercial for that was fucking brilliant because it was for a family. Issues? No, for Family Values. Oh, Family Values. Because yeah. it was, it was, it was corn, it was Limp Biscuit, it was Ice Cube, and I think Orgy was the fourth one. And, right. they, and it was like, you know, hey, mom, can you pass the limp biscuit? Oh, sure, but make sure you hand over the corn. Dad, can I get an ice cube for my drink? And then somehow, I can't remember how they did it. They they included orgy in there or something like that. And it was just so fucking funny. Fucking okay. A. Yep. No, I, I wish that I had been paying more attention during that. that. That's the time when you you don't really want to live in America now. You want to live in America in the mid nineties, that's when you want to, when MTV's pumping, when those th- tours are happening, that is, you were so lucky. You really were so lucky to be you young know, in and, and being in the discovery stage of music in the mid nineties, when everything was just catered to you. Do you MTV I, do you was know built what, for you at that yeah, age. And you, and you know what I account all of our problems in the United States for over the past 30 years? Rock and roll and television. MTV doesn't play music videos anymore. Look at when the, the decline of society started to happen. The decline. You're right. It's, it's all They MTV's stopped playing fault. fucking music videos, man. Thank, yeah. yeah. Who needs another fucking 16 and pregnant? Jersey Shore. Play fucking music videos and watch society crawl out of the goddamn gutter. Guaranteed. <laughs> Guaranteed. It's what I think about Bring back things. Carson Daly. He's, on, he's over on NBC, man. Just have him walk over to... Uh, the old MTV studios, man. Let's do some TRL up in this bitch. We'll bring Matt Pinfield back. Right. Fuck yeah. Kurt Loader. Hell yeah. Kurt Louder. All right. We're going to wrap it up. I'm so late. I've got to bounce, brother. Yeah. I got. I actually have pro- videos I still got to produce tonight. So anyway, oh, yeah. I appreciate everybody listening to me rambling about anxieties and stuff. And uh, Mick Fleetwood is awesome. So is his nephew. And leave your comments. Guys, if, you, if anyone else can empathize, if you're struggling with things... <laughs> message me, tell us in the comments and let's start yeah. a conversation get the stuff yeah, out that's, of and that's and that and, and shim's right there that is one thing i've always tried to promote if i'm ever on somebody else's podcast or anything is that if anybody's going through some shit you can always send a message because i try to respond to every single message that i get um and especially if it's somebody's like hey i'm just you know i'm going through a rough patch oh i'm you know i'll send you a thumbs up or i'll just be like hey you know what everybody goes through some shit you just heard about me going through some shit in, in fucking hawaii of all places man yeah so Everybody does, and uh, we'll call this. Everybody's one good. got issues. Everybody's got issues, man. <laughs> All right, We're gonna wrap it up it. there. Say bye, Encore. Take care. Bye, Encore.